Olá, bem-vindos à Igreja no Mundo, o programa da Fundação AES Ajuda à Igreja que Sofre. Sou o Paulo White e hoje vamos ver um documentário, todo ele dedicado à Ucrânia. A Ucrânia viveu nos tempos em que estava integrada na União Soviética, tempos de uma enorme repressão à Igreja, em que os cristãos foram perseguidos e muitas vezes até presos e mortos. Esta repressão terminou só no início dos anos 90 do século passado. Vamos ver então este documentário. You may want to precisely describe what happened here, but it is not possible. Everything was happening on the border of reality and unreality. Miracle after miracle, miracle after miracle. This is a great repetition and an extension of the Acts of the Apostles. It all started with Saint Andrew, who, driven by the will to tell what he experienced as an apostle, went up north until he reached the Dnieper River, where today's Kiev is situated. He placed the cross on the hill and he made the prophecy. This cross will become a leaven for the great center of Christianity in this part of the world. After Saint Andrew, many struggled to fulfill the prophecy. 900 years later, the cross truly ruled over this place thanks to the Grand Prince of Kiev, Vladimir the Great. After being baptized, he changed from a mugger and debaucher into a wise and merciful ruler. However, he kept on cruelly punishing the heathen. As a result of the Great Schism, Christianity has been divided into Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic. The lands of today's Ukraine were assigned to the Orthodox Church. Over the centuries, the Greek Catholic Church came into existence. She recognized the dogma and sovereignty of the Pope, but was culturally rooted in the Eastern Rite. Three churches were coexisting peacefully, becoming the mainstay of cultural and religious identity of the Ukrainian nation. Everything changed once the communists came into power. The church became the greatest enemy of the state. The temples were destroyed, priests and faithful were executed or sent to gulags. The man was no longer needed if he wasn't useful for the communist future. Divorces, abortion, alcoholism became social plagues. The perestroika, fall of the Soviet Union and independence of Ukraine created a new space for the work of the churches. But years of atheistic propaganda resulted in many Ukrainians living in spiritual emptiness. But God kept on calling people who were to fulfill St. Andrew's prophecy and create the great center of Christianity in this part of the world. This calling is a strange thing. I always wanted to be a doctor. But during the exam to medical university, a flash, I decided to be a priest. I stood up and walked out. I got to the underground seminary. Being a priest for just 10 months, I got a decree for the whole of east of Ukraine. Without a church, without any people or parish, I only got territory. And off I went into the great unknown. Of 
Kosciuszko. The Catholic Church didn't exist in this region at all. Ever since they executed, in 1938, the parish priest, with over a hundred of active parishioners who were defending the church and their faith, nobody remembered anymore that such an institution like a Catholic church had ever existed. Furthermore, nobody even wanted to remember. The church was converted into a repair shop for cinema equipment and a repository for tickets and movie copies. On the 7th of January, 1991, the first after-war mass was celebrated on the stairs of the church in Kharkiv. Five people were present. I was very surprised that none of them even though they claimed to be Christians, knew how to make the sign of the cross. To my calling, Lord be with you, they replied, thank you, Father. This mass took one and a half hour, because first I had to explain everything that we do during the mass, and only then actually do it. It was the beginning of the Catholic Church in the uh, East Ukraine. But Yuri Yezhe came for the first time and we started the service. The first Mass was celebrated on the steps. It was a struggle. Passing drivers were revving their engines and honking because they thought we were insane standing there like that. I was walking down this street and I saw a gathering. Behind me, people were walking, sometimes a car passed by. Behind me, there was the world which I belonged to. In front of me, a world which I did not know. I understood that I can't be sitting on the fence any longer. I needed to see where the truth was. It was already 1991, when in general, the whole society began to have a different point of view of things like the church, faith, God. They were no longer ridiculed and forbidden. Finally, one could speak about them. We did not talk about such topics at home because it was the Soviet Union. So religion was described as an opium for the people, that is, for ignorant people. We were always saying that the church is for the grannies who know nothing, who never studied, and who don't know that God doesn't exist. And only those grannies in their handkerchiefs with those candles would go to church. I had never read the Bible, so I didn't know. I just knew this atheism of mine, which I was studying at the university. The career, a role in society, these were the values that were widely promoted. They were perceived as something good, important, something which one should strive to attain. Also, the fight against world imperialism. How can one do without it? When we realized that the Soviet Union is over, then it dawned on me that everything we were taught was a lie that, roughly speaking, they definitely scammed us. Hmm. To the question, firstly, about the meaning of a life. Before, the party was giving the answer to the question, but now it is not clear at all why a person lives and why they should live, how to build life and what to do with it. 
And what is the truth? Well, the words from the Bible fit him perfectly. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. And somehow slowly, the existence of, let's say, this world of the invisible became more real. That means the life is not limited only to what can be weighed and measured. Father Yerji certainly had a great influence. He spent a lot of time to answer the questions that I had. And somehow, sympathetically, helped these answers to appear. And then, at the introduction, and after joining the order, he supported me in this endeavor. Father Yezhi didn't make a fuss. He would call them by their name and show these people what they are capable of. Tell them, you are not just anybody. So don't stay there. You came here, so keep on going. You made one step, go on, make another one. Go on, jump, it's time. And he knew how to show them something more than this grim reality, than those empty shelves. He was giving hope to people. Father Yezhe was sent here then as the only one. He was traveling down the whole east. They remember him here as a madman, God's madman. He gave up his whole youth to serve here. I went to the head cities of other Vovoid ships. Everywhere, we managed to restore the Roman Catholic parishes within a couple of years. I would celebrate majority of the masses next to the ruins of the Catholic churches, sometimes in private flats. I was knocking on people's doors to stay overnight, maybe have something to eat. When I understood I have no more strength, I started to demand, even from the bishop, to give me priests to help. Then I invited religious sisters from different convents. And they came. And it was also a hero's attitude. I bought some barracks, and I converted them into a vicarage that consisted of priest house, religious sister's house, a kitchen, and a parish office. 
To jest nasze mieszkanie, tuż właśnie przy kościele. To są nasze łóżka, nasze szafy, tu jest biurko, cała kancelaria, nie tylko wśród franciszkanek, ale prawie kościoła całego plebanii. Z tego miejsca, gdzie tutaj jestem, gdzie jedzą siostry franciszkanki przy tym stole, często kapie z sufitu. Dolewa nam się do talerza, ale to nic nie szkodzi. Those were the most beautiful years for us. It was hard because the conditions were hard. But the community was so amazing. The faith was so lively. People were newly converted. Everything they did, how they lived, they were not talking and not thinking, but simply living the faith. Yes meant yes, no meant no. And there was nothing in between. I liked it so much. At the time, I really learned a lot. As a Christian, as a Catholic, of this living faith. Till today, I am based on it, and it helps me a lot. Sisters came and started the charity activities at the church feeding the homeless people. It was a truly destroyed church, impossible to rebuild it. But next to it, there was a kiosk, and this is where they served poor people. They gave them the medicines, food, and this impression, the church in ruins, priests in the barracks, and despite that, they already take care of the poor. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the country collapsed and the value system disintegrated. Everyone was just thinking of themselves. And the people who before had work and were secure, now were left with no job, unsecured. There's plenty of homeless people. But the winter was so severe and they were living on the streets. They were coming with such frostbites, legs, hands, nose, face. It was horrible. It was the first time we had seen something like this. Some of them had two PhDs, very knowledgeable, but not clever. They didn't know how to find themselves in the new reality. They were used to the academic work and not to such harsh conditions. It was all makeshift. The fact that we managed to get out of the 90s alive is just thanks to the Lord's mercy and his love for our nation. They are wonderful. All people here are happy with them. Those who come, all people are happy. The charity work was the biggest aid in the history of rebirth and development of the Catholic Church in eastern Ukraine.
It is difficult, materially difficult. We break the floors, we have to heat the house. We did not want our children to live such a life. Who needs us? Only the church helps us with the clothes and different products. Nobody else. This is for us until tomorrow morning. It is a soup that Brother Alois gave us. People who suffer say that the Catholic Church is the only institution that helps. We don't do politics. Our only politics is to help people and pray. I am gravely grateful to the sisters that they agreed to come here and were able to take the burden of the tragedy of homeless people. But what was scariest for them as women, that was the discovery of the street children. I remember when I offered to the sisters to go and see the street children. These were kids without parents or from pathological families. They gathered in such gangs and lived in canals. The entrance was like this. It was very deep. But you need to go inside. After a few attempts, I finally jumped in there. When she got there, she sat down with them and they started to cuddle with her as if she was their mother. And they immediately fell asleep. The sister started weeping. She was crying, but they were asleep. I couldn't look at this. I had my heart in my throat. I even stopped breathing. It was too much. They had a dream of a real home, and they created an imitation of such a real home underground. A floor rug. Someone dumped one into the garbage. They found it and laid it on the floor. Bedding is a must. It is black from dirt. But we can't do without it, sister. We spent some time drinking tea together. They said it was necessary to pray. Because they knew we were Catholics and nuns, so they had to pray with us, you know? And it was also so cool, because they treated us as people who came from the church. We would always tell them about it, because we brought them not only food, but we also had to bring them God. If we had brought them only food, it would have helped for a while. But if they try to change their lives, it gives them a chance to make it. And without God, this seemed to be impossible in such conditions, in such crises. My parents were pathological drinkers. They drank away three flats, all money, and left us nothing. I did not find a job and could not get an apartment. I stayed on the street. But in my case, everything changed. The church helped me a lot. They showed me another way, taught me how to live like others do, to go and work, have and raise children. 
What happened to me? I met my wife. The baby was born. All was well. With God's help and with prayer, life gets better. I look at us, people of the East, like children from an orphanage. We had food, we had good living conditions, but there was no such thing as parental love. And if you haven't experienced that, it's as if you are locked up in an orphanage and only material things matter to you. Suddenly, your parents come, open the door, and tell you that they have been looking for you all these years, and now they want to hug you. Father Jesus speaks about human dignity, that it does not stem from the fact that I am a member of Komsomol, a daughter of the Soviet Union, but that I am God's daughter. We are all from the orphanage called the Soviet Union. Father Jesus led us out of it. E assim com este documentário sobre a Ucrânia e os desafios que se colocam à Igreja neste país do leste da Europa, chegamos ao fim de mais um Igreja no Mundo aqui na sua televisão. Despeço-me com amizade, até à próxima semana, até ao próximo Igreja no Mundo, se Deus quiser.